Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you today. Thank you for being here. We have guests among us, and we thank you for being here especially. Hope you'll enjoy and want to come back and be with us again. We want also to acknowledge and thank those who are watching us on the live stream. We're always happy to know that you're there. Every week I learn about more of my old friends who are tuning in and worshiping with us. Welcome, friends, and welcome, strangers. We're happy to be here and to have the opportunity to share with you in your homes or wherever you are. And we're happy to be able still to gather as we do today. So welcome back to some people who've been out and are able to return today. Some been out of town and you've come home. Guys, good to see you. We always look forward to seeing you. It, it's just good to be together. And we've decided this morning to change the order of worship again. I think maybe I should say, we, we don't do this to try to be cute or something, but we want to help everybody as much as possible to focus on what we're really doing rather than this the same routine that might allow minds to drift more than if we have some change in it. And so we try to plan it so that it will be more meaningful to you, and we hope that it is. Don't mean it to be disturbing. It does violate a little bit of tradition about three songs and a prayer and another song and a sermon, but that, it's not about that. It's try to help. So today, we're going to be intermittently having Jed lead some songs, and then the Lord's Supper will be toward the end rather than as it usually is in the beginning. The next song that we'll be singing together is number 230. 230 is the next one that we'll be using if you're using the book, and then beyond that, 205, isn't it? If you want to get both of those, if Jed chooses to sing them both, uh, that's the order in which we will be singing. And then I'll tell you some more as, as we get to those. But just intermittently, we'll have four or five songs that will go along with what we're talking about in the lesson. You know, this, this is December. That's not any news to you, of course. But in December, there tends to be a great deal of attention that is given to the birth of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that that is inappropriate. I'm just saying that's the day and, and the month in which we focus a great deal on the birth of Jesus, and we celebrate a lot of things about his birth. Some of them are biblically oriented, and some of them are things that just have come in from tradition. Our point here is not to attack or to do that, but I, I got the occurring to me that this would be a really good time for us to move to the other end of the scale and think about the death of Jesus. Now, there's a lot of inhumanity, you might say, associated with that. There was a lot of injustice. There was a lot of inappropriate uh, things. There was a lot of politics, and we could spend our time focusing on all of that and upon the players that are involved and the, the where the blame might be so far as that time and circumstance are concerned. But I, I want us to look more into what is accomplished and to realize that when we take this day to particularly think about when Jesus died, it's in every way appropriate, appropriate for us uh, any time. But right now, as we are in this season of joy, let's realize that there's more to be celebrated than the birth of Jesus, but that in fact, that celebration ought to also include the facts about the death of Jesus. We could talk about his historical uh, being, that he was more than just a man, and that becomes altogether clear whenever we really study about when Jesus died. It was recorded in all the Gospels. Matthew talks about the death of Jesus in chapter 27, verses 32 to 56. A brief review of what he says there is that after the trial, and we would add that it's like a mock trial, but after that trial is over, and after 
the injustice is already determined that it's going to occur. When Pilate has, in my opinion, wimped on his responsibility, and injustice seems just to definitely going to be going to occur, Matthew says that they took him out and they found a man named Simon of Cyrene, and they made him carry the cross of Jesus up to Golgotha. That's called the place of the skull. Others of the records indicate that Jesus carried the cross himself as long as he could, as far as he could, but he'd already been beaten to within the inch of his life, and he's weakened by a week of questions and trials and total uh, focusing on what's about to happen from all from the time of the triumphant entry until now everything has just been loaded loaded with incidents and Jesus is tired and he's weary and, and then they beat him and almost kill him and it's no wonder it's no surprise that he'd fall under the weight of the cross as he moved up that incline toward Golgotha when that man had taken, I suppose Jesus followed then in his footsteps. And Matthew simplifies it then just by saying that they crucified him. And when they crucified him, he says that the soldiers cast lots for his garments. That sounds to me to be so cheap. A man's life is being taken unjustly and soldiers cast dice to see who gets what little clothing that he had. Is there no respect at all? And there wasn't. But that was not really a surprise to those who knew Scripture. And then when they got through deciding who'd get the garments, Matthew says they sat down to watch. How's this going to go? How's this going to play out? Because there had been a lot of drama. Pilate had ordered there be a sign placed on his cross. There were three. But on his cross, Jesus, the King of the Jews. And that became the focus at the moment. And... On either side of him, a, a robber, some translations say, two thieves were crucified too. And they argued, and one of them had a conversation directly with Jesus that had a wonderful promise in it this day, you will be with me in paradise. The crowd, we don't know who they all were. Maybe leaders of the Jews, maybe just people of the street. We, we don't know, but they came by and here's the claim that this is the king of the Jews and they are Jews and they haven't acknowledged him and they haven't accepted him either as the son of God, the savior. And so they cry out insulting things. <laughs> you saved others, let's say you save yourself. If you come down from the cross, then maybe we'll believe you. In time, when he said, I thirst, someone got a sponge and dipped it in some vinegar-type stuff, and it might have been intended to be, to some degree, a, a little bit of a, a way to ease his pain, but Jesus refused it. Others said, wait, don't give him that. Let's, it sounds like he's calling for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah comes and helps him. Because in the throes of that all, Jesus had cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they said, let's just see if anybody will answer. Maybe Elijah will come. And then 
the scripture said Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and he gave up the spirit, the ghost. He died. But that wasn't the end of that at all. For as Jesus died at the end of that period of three hours of darkness and quietness in the city, there was an earthquake and the temple veil was rent in twain. It, it, it broke, tore right down the middle. And besides that, from the earthquakes, the souls of those who had died came forth and mingled among the people. And some people saw them. When all that occurred, the centurion, the man over a hundred soldiers, the one over these who had gambled over who would get the clothing of Jesus, and maybe some of them too, said, this really was the Son of God. How many people too late will realize that yet in the resurrection? Oh yes, when Jesus died, it, it, it demands our attention is worthy of our focus. It's worthy of note. This was essentially and spectacularly and singularly the only time any event ever happened like this. And is introducing the only time ever that some religious leader gave himself for the cause, was killed, and then came back. It's worthy of note that this is singular. It is worthy of note that we need to remember it. That we need to have it in our mind all the time. And God, knowing that, had Jesus on the night before his death institute what we commonly call the Lord's Supper. And that in the New Testament, the apostles reminded us that on every first day of the week, when we come together to worship, that we should emulate that supper, remembering the death of the body of Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood and the intent, the purpose of where and what that is all about. It's worthy of attention for that reason and God by the Holy Spirit made sure that we would know that. It's worthy of recognition for the profound fact that this is the only, only way that the sins of mankind would ever see anything that would have the power to forgive the sin of man. This is it. Here's where it's played out. Here's where it's presented. Later, whenever the Sanhedrin court asked the apostle, by what authority do you do the things that you're doing? The apostle Peter said, there's no other name given among men by which man can be saved. He's referring to the name of Jesus. 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 Who had said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Let's sing.
Himself on the cross of Calvary of Golgotha for our souls, did so, and we must acknowledge and constantly we should attribute thanks to Him, because when He died, He did so in a substitutional way. He did so in order that He might vicariously die for someone else. Paul said, for a good man sometimes, someone will dare to die. But he presents the question, when did you ever hear of someone being willing to die? For someone because of his unworthiness, because of his sin, this is the exception. This is the person who's stepping in for someone else, not because they deserve it and not because it is something that, that's called for and, and it's the, the common thing that's done, but because in this case, he would be willing to lay down his life for someone else. In the book of John in chapter 10, it's a, chapter we famously know for Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. And he said, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And in verses 17 and 18, he says, no one takes my life from me. I voluntarily, I lay down my life. No one can take it from me, but I give it willingly for my sheep. He gave his life for us. The word of God iterates again and again that there was a price that has to be paid for sin and that all of us are sinners 
And so every one of us would be guilty except for the fact that he voluntarily would pay that price for us. John said in John chapter 1 and verse 29, when he saw Jesus coming to him, to the place where he was preaching, he drew the attention of the crowds to the presence of Jesus when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. He said, Behold, this is the one who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus said, I give my life, I give it willingly. Notable that Jesus took no offense. That this is just profound. That this became the you could say the lot of the Son of God, but it was placed in the future, before he came to this earth, it was a fact that was going to occur from the foundation of the world. And you could easily say, that was not fair. Before it was born, it already was known that he'd die for us. Indeed, unfair but notable that he never showed any resentment for the lot that he had. Isaiah in chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 explains where we are in this picture. He said, the hand of the Lord is not shortened he, that he cannot reach you, and his ear is not dull that he cannot hear you, but your sin." has separated between you and your God, and your iniquity has hidden his face from you, that he will not hear you. And yet, Paul explained Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus willingly assumed the role of the one who would die for the sins of the world. And that though he had a place that was on a par commonly stated that way, that he was on a par with God, and yet he did not resent leaving that to come to this earth to suffer like he did, and that for us. It's clear in the Garden of Gethsemane. On that last night before Jesus would be taken and would be flogged and beaten and slapped and spit on, the house of the high priest that night and then the next day crucified, they didn't resent that he was called upon to do this for our sin. In fact, in that famous prayer, he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He said, whatever has to be, for man to be saved, let it be. He didn't owe us anything, but yet he was willing to give. It wasn't a price he should have to pay for his own sin, but for ours, and he was willing to give, and he didn't have to. In fact... He could have, and he acknowledged it. He could have called 10,000 angels. I want us to sing now verse 354 and follow that with 349. Jed. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom me, and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast Oh, 
349, 10,000 angels. Or 349. They found the hands of Jesus in the garden. details about Jesus' life and his death were indeed prophesied over and over again in the Old Testament with so much specificity that it could clearly not have been by accident. Over 300 times in the Old Testament, there are prophecies concerning him, all of which are fulfilled in the New Testament. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6 speaks of the fact that his back would be beaten and that his face would be spit upon. Isaiah 53 speaks so graphically of the punishment and the very fact that it would be on a cross and that he would suffer and bleed and die and it would be the stripes on his back that would be healing ours. By his stripes, we are healed. In Psalm 16 and 10, it is promised that his body would see no corruption and that his soul 
would not go down to Sheol. Psalms 22 and verse 1 even have the prophetic words that he would utter on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This way that he served for us is to remove our sin. Our next song we're going to sing in a moment will deal with that in verses, uh, chapter 300, I'm sorry, song number 376. And we'll do that just before we'll have the Lord's Supper that's designed to cause all that to come back to mind. But our sins were the issue. Romans chapter 5, Paul talks about in verse 6 that when we were yet helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. He explains in verse 8 that God was by that showing his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. He reasons in verse 10 that if he would do that for us while we were sinners, Think of what he will bless us with as we become and have become his children. When Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, he reminds that we then are become ambassadors for him, beseeching you in his stead. Be ye reconciled to Christ, or to God, as the translation may read. He said, for he has made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we who are sin might be counted as righteous. We get moved over into the column of those who have been cleansed. As I said a while ago, the scriptures make it clear that there's a price to be paid for sin. But John and verse John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 explains how in that substitutionary way, Jesus moves in to cover the penalty. He said, I write these things unto you, my little children, that you may not sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation for our sins not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. This is our Jesus. And this is what was accomplished whenever Jesus died. Usually, we make every effort to teach people, to train people, to realize that in living the Christian life and the role that we have in the kingdom as the ambassadors for Jesus Christ to a lost world, that we should learn to understand it's not about us. I was impacted by a question recently. I think I mentioned to you that, that Daniel, our son-in-law, called me for an interview on the phone because he had to write a five-page article from an interview from a veteran preacher. The last question he asked was, in all your experience, what is the singular lesson that you have learned that stands out? And I was surprised that I didn't have to even contemplate. But the answer was right there. The greatest thing I've learned in these years of preaching and ministry is that it's not about me. And yet, I tell you today that when Jesus died, it was all about us. That's why. Let's sing our song and remember him in the Lord's Supper. I'll come back for an invitation in a moment. And Jed will need to tell you that song 
number when the time comes. This is number 376. an honor to be here on this wonderful day that we have. We always assemble here to worship, to read from the scripture, and to understand why we do the things we do. This morning, as we're about to partake of the Lord's Supper of the Communion, I'd like to just go through that a little bit. The Bible tells us to take the communion on the first day of the week, and that's in Acts 20. And when gathered together, and communion is written about in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke the 22nd chapter, and Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Why Jesus gave us salvation. A way around eternal damnation and he wants everyone to remember that. He loves us. He died for our sins and they crucified his body. As you came in this morning, I hope that everyone got a packet that has the juice and the bread within it. If not, Raise your hand and we will get that to you. At this time, let's go to our Heavenly Father and pray for the, the bread. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning. We thank you so much for the blessings of life you've given to us. We thank you for the privilege to be able to come here to worship you in truth and harmony. And Father, as we are about to partake of this bread that was that was given to us through scripture to partake of every week or when we assemble we pray father will we do so in a way and a manner to be pleasing to you help us to remember 
father, the body that was beaten and put on the cross, that was tortured and, and torn for each and every one of us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Through the vine represents the ever-cleansing blood he shed for us. And uh, again in 1 Corinthians 11 and 27 through 29. So then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment upon themselves. Let's pray for the cup. Father in heaven, again we come to you. We thank you for the sacrifice your son made in our place. The sacrifice that takes away our sin. And Father, as we're about to partake of this cup, we pray that we will understand the cleansing blood of Jesus that he shed on that cross. Jesus, a man of 33 years old that was tortured for something that he did not do for each and every one of us on this world. Father, we pray that our hearts, our minds are always in the right place when we come here when we partake of these emblems to remember our, our Lord and Savior. And Father, be with us in all that we do, that we will always remember that and not turn away, not forget the ultimate sacrifice that he gave for us. When he died on the cross, he made us rich. He made us to where we could, we could say that a million dollars is nothing, but eternal life with you is worth everything. And Father, as we partake of this emblem, we pray that we do it properly. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Sometimes at this point, we say apart from communion, we also take the opportunity to give back to, to our Lord and Savior. The offering is, is a loving and, and giving thing to me. It's a, it's a hand in hand deal. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of ways to love. There's, there's brotherly love, there's uh, heavenly love, there's all kinds of love. In the same way, there's all kinds of ways to give. We can give through our means, we can give through what we do, we can give through service. We can give for no good reason, but just because this is what our Lord and Savior wants us to do. He wants us to love, and he wants us to give. And it's about as clear as it can get. So we pray. Father, this morning as we give back to you a minor portion of what you've blessed us with, we thank you so much for that opportunity we, th we pray, Father, that we remember our examples in Scripture of, of uh, the widow that gave everything, that had nothing left and give it all. And, Father, we, we need to think of about the sacrifice that Jesus did make to us. 
that gift of salvation if we only pursue it. And Father, it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Through our lives, I suppose all of us receive various kinds of invitations to events, birthday parties, celebratory experiences for others, retirement parties, all kinds of things, anniversaries. And some of those cards that we receive with the invitation, and sometimes the wording that's in them is in fact so beautiful that you just read it and reread it because it's encouraging and, and really inviting. You want to be a part of that. I think the most beautiful invitation that there is that man has ever received is the one that Jesus expressed in Matthew eleven twenty eight when he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And you know why it's the most beautiful? Maybe it's not the most beautiful as far as the, the composition of words and poetry and, and those kinds of things. It's the most beautiful because of him who offers the invitation. It's from Jesus. It's from the Son of God. It's from my Savior. Oh, it's beautiful. And I'm a sinner. I don't deserve it. It's beautiful. Come and I'll give you rest. We're going to sing a song of encouragement and as it were, Jesus is expressing through that song, that very invitation. Maybe you're here today and you've never become a Christian. Jesus said, come. Maybe you're here and you're part of the kingdom of God, but bad things have happened in your life. You slipped away, maybe back into sin. And Jesus says, come, come home. And maybe there's just distress in your life and you feel like I need somebody to pray for me. And Jesus says, come. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Come. Because he died. He offers that invitation. We'll invite you to stand and sing the song Jed has announced. And we invite you to come if you need to right now while we stand and sing.